Another episode of BSing with Sean K. I am your host, Sean Neese. The K is silent. And on this show, I talk to a wide range of people pursuing their creative and intellectual passions, artists, activists, bloggers, comedians, actors, musicians, and others living outside the box, providing a platform for opinions and perspectives not often heard in the mainstream media. And for this episode, I'm going to play you a conversation I had with Christine Hillary Lee, who is an actress and a martial artist. And I'm reading from her bio here. Christine H. Lee is a Brooklyn-born and raised actress to a family of Chinese immigrants. She attended LaGuardia High School, graduating in 2012, and is expected to graduate from the Maggie Flanagan Acting Training Program later this year. Christine is also trained in various martial arts, including Muay Thai, Taekwondo, and MMA since she was 10 years old. She's a passionate artist with a fierce heart. Christine portrays the powerful Yellow Ranger in a viral Power Rangers web series entitled Power Rangers Unworthy. And yeah, that's uh, I looked into some of that. It's actually pretty cool. There's a lot of cool fan-made projects out there. Um, also for Star Wars too. I was I was I did a I was a part of a Batman fan project. It's like Batman in the 1930s, like when the original comics came out, and I voiced a character in that. But uh, that's yet to be released. But that was pretty fun. Anyway, we get into a lot of interesting topics. Like I do with most of my guests, and we get into um, like ways of getting into the industry, what it means to be an artist, you know, using art as an outlet versus having a separate outlet and having your art be something else. And anyway, I won't give too much more away. Here's the conversation, and I hope you enjoy it. So, how you been? How's uh, how's everything going with you? I'm good. Um... I am currently going to the pit, uh, meeting people like you, trying to do the whole comedy thing. Um, and I'm currently in an evening acting conservatory as well. And, um, you know, just slowly putting things into my schedule and, uh, um, you know, trying to try to make life make sense right now. Yeah, you're you're more folk, uh, traditional acting is like your thing, right? As opposed to, like, imp- improv is just something that kind of helps with that. Or, well, um, I feel like I'm very open ended uh, as far as my goals go. Um, especially, you know, I feel like if you want to be a performer, I think there's like a general um, direction that you might want to go in. But I think it's a good idea to always just like keep your um options open I definitely started out wanting to be a, an exclusively like a dramatic actor and do tv and film and theater um and then I took some classes at UCB and um was thought it was like a good like supplemental thing to what I what I wanted to do at the time but I picked up improv again at the pit not too long ago and I was like wait this is really good for me and now I would say comedy is like one of those, one of my main ambitions now. Do you, do you want to try your hand at a uh, stand-up or just like comedic acting? I don't know anything about stand-up. Um, I don't know the structure or how you go about doing it. And right now it doesn't really appeal to me. Um, but yeah, I really love improv and um, anything scripted as well is definitely something that I um, love doing and want to do more of yeah I mean I, I stand up to me is like a little too much like putting I don't know I, I mean I'm fine with putting myself out there but like in a stand-up way it's, I feel like that's the most like vulnerable you can get just kind of putting yourself yourself especially if you make your stand-up like personal like it's like you're putting mm. yourself out there and kind of la- but at the same time you're kind of laughing at yourself so it's yeah 
Yeah, I could totally see that. Um, I've asked a whole bunch of people like what they preferred stand up and uh, or improv, and a lot of people have different answers. Um, I think uh, a lot of people are scared of improv because they just have to trust um, in the options, and there's a very likely possibility of you choosing the wrong options or whatever wrong is. Um, but stand up, it, uh, yeah, you're right. You are telling. A, a true story about yourself, even though it might be exaggerated. Um, but yeah, to me, I guess like I could be wrong, but I guess maybe one of the reasons stand up doesn't appeal to me is because it doesn't seem as acting heavy, maybe. Um, it sounds more maybe writing based. Um, and I do like writing as well, but um, it definitely seems a bit more structured than. Um, maybe acting or improv might be acting's been something I'm pursuing as well like both comedic and dramatic short films I've been in but uh do, do you feel like you want to pick one or the other like comedic or dramatic or do you kind of want to try your hand at the different styles I think knowing me like my focus shifts every few months but it always stays under the umbrella of art like I studied visual arts in high school and I like drawing and I like painting and then I moved on to acting and then I learned about singing and then I learned about dancing so everything I've done in my life has always been under the umbrella of art and now it's kind of just like narrowing down into acting um but I don't think there's much of a difference between dramatic acting and com comedic acting as much as people might think um like, I think, for example, like Jane Krakowski, right? She's like the blonde in 30 Rock. She's also in Kimmy Schmidt. Oh, yeah. And she was in, uh, she, yeah, the Kimmy Schmidt uh, sketch. She's done a lot of sketch stuff. Yes. Well, mainly 30 Rock and uh, Kimmy Schmidt, I think, is the main two things she's been in. But, yes. But, yeah. Um, yeah. So she started in, mus in musical theater um, when she was younger, and she did a lot of Broadway stuff. But, you know, everyone knows her as a comedic actress, and most of her work is rooted in comedy. But when you see a lot of her acting scenes in Kimmy Schmidt they're they're acted with quite like realism you know she's not a clown she's I wouldn't even call her a clown like when I think of clown I think of someone like Jim Carrey or um even Steve Martin Martin Short even Catherine O'Hara um but she has like a lot of serious scenes that if you maybe replace the music or made the color grading a little different it could very well be a drama um so i think in my opinion the comedy i really want to do is uses the best of dramatic acting which is to say acting that is very much rooted in realism rather than clownishness yeah well even for comedic acting you kind of got to invest in the reality yes is. very much like, like even if it seems silly to the audience it has to seem real for you and then that adds yes. the humor to it too yeah you have to be able to widen the stakes or lower the stakes and that is like that is acting you know yeah so i guess we'll go back to like the beginning like how you how did you get interested in acting and everything growing up was it something you wanted to do like as a kid or wow um i never thought i was going to do acting in a million years as a kid i really um struggled to just have conversations with people I struggled a lot with like socializing with other children um and I always thought of myself as like an introvert who wanted to stay at home and like just be away from the world um which is why I like to do art like uh visual arts because you don't really need to collaborate with anyone else to create something so you know I would always watch I I would see people on stage and be like, there's no way I could do that. Like in any form of exhibitionism, I'd just be like that, that makes no sense to me. Um, and then I grew older and I took my first acting class in college, which was an acting 101 class just for fun, I guess, or out of curiosity. And I really had no idea what acting was. And then I realized it wasn't performing. It was literally being yourself in a certain heightened or um, manufactured way and I was like wow wait this is everything I care about you know like the the authenticity of um humanhood so that class 
taught me that acting is about the authenticity of humanhood. And I was like, what? Like, cause I always thought acting was like fake. There was like some idea of people being fake. So that's why it didn't really appeal to me. Um, so when I learned that it was about, not about that, I was hooked and I started taking a whole bunch of acting classes, anything I could get my hands on ever since. Yeah. Well, and it's also imagining like how you would react in certain scenarios, even if the person's like different from you, like there's certain like human things you share that you can kind of pull from and relate to. Yeah. There's so much universality in acting the whole, I, I think a lot of it is based on the belief that we are all familiar with pretty much every emotion, which is why we can be moved by actors or a performance because we can relate to them or see ourselves in them at, in some regard. Um, even though you might be doing character work or you're playing someone a lot different from who you are in real life, there is you know a part of you in them. Otherwise the performance is just not gonna be engaging. Yeah. Well, I guess it's a combination of like your own experience and then using your imagination. Yes. So guess, yes, yes, become, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, so do you feel like you've come out of your shell more with acting? Like, do you feel more social now than you used to or? Oh my God. I think it kind of like, I used it. Acting definitely helped with mental health. Not as not, there's always a thing uh, set in acting classes that acting classes should not be your therapy. You should have therapy as your therapy. But like acting was my therapy for, especially during the beginning because um, it allowed me to be a very heightened, authentic state in front of other people or even with someone else on stage, which I really struggled with in real life. And um, sorry, what was the question again? Like ha if it helped you come out, of, have you come out of your shell more since like do you feel yes. have you become like more social and uh, through the acting absolutely I mean it definitely wasn't the the only thing you know I was also doing other things as well just doing life going to events and you know going to like working jobs being put in circumstances that kind of forced me to socialize a bit more but acting definitely blew my world wide open because I was just like, wait, what? We could be authentic with each other? It was just a wild concept to me at the time. Yeah, just kind of getting out of your comfort zone and putting yourself out there in different yeah. ways. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I always felt like I communicate better through like some kind of medium or some kind of art form, like doing a podcast or like writing um, like a script or like a story or doing like acting or music to like. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. That was my main yeah, focus music. for a while. Now I'm getting back into it a bit. But. Nice. Music is more abstract in my opinion, but I think because it's more abstract, you can be more authentic with it. It puts you in a vulnerable place without, you know, just straight up saying, this is how I feel. This is what I went through, you know? So I think music in that regard can be very freeing. Yeah. You mean, you mean like, um, because there's more you can say through the music than just words or like you're talking about like the instrumental part of it or um you can use other ways of communicating besides words so like um i guess have you what have been some ways like you've communicated like have, have you had like projects where you kind of communicated what you were feeling or like i don't know what you mean been, like, like within the, the project outlet? Yeah, like what's been like a, a good, what do you think has been the best outlet for you as far as expressing yourself? Outlet. I think outlet and creating something for an audience are two quite different things. Um, because when you're making art, in my opinion, it should not be for yourself. It should be for other people. But as far as outlets, I have a lot, a lot of journals. I started journaling in 2012 and I have about 30 like thick sketchbooks like lined on a bookshelf since then um I that's another thing I, I think journaling has kind of been a, a huge main tool just like anchoring me and organizing my thoughts um 
you know, dancing, movement. Uh, I teach kickboxing and I learned martial arts since I was pretty young. So that has also been my outlet. And I think that is to say that your outlet should ultimately enhance your art rather than the other way around. So with, with journaling, you mean just like writing out whatever anxieties or like thoughts you had and stuff like I, I did that for a while too, just like, well, typing it out, like different um, like thoughts I had, and then I can see certain patterns and kind of analyze them and stuff, but that, that's definitely helpful. Oh ways. yeah. It's, it's, it's so underrated, I think. And it's also a practice too. Like, I think the more you do it, the more benefit you get because you understand your, what exactly to journal to help yourself. Um, but yeah, for me, it's very open-ended. Sometimes it's just like to analyze the social interaction that I observed or that I was in. Um, a lot of times it's about what I'm feeling in the moment. And sometimes it's to organize my goals in life. You know, it, it's really, it's really anything. Cause so many things can get jumbled up in your brain when you don't speak about, or when you don't write about it. Yeah. If you don't have it like down on paper. So, so do you like, do you think your goal is more like with the acting, like out of everything you're doing, like being, being in TV or like on the stage or. Yeah, that would be that at the moment, that is my short, that is my goal, which I'm so open for it to change. Maybe I'll wake up one day and be like, Hmm, maybe I want to write or hmm, maybe I want to um, do something else with comedy. Um, but for right now, for example, I, have an agent that sends me auditions and my short-term goal is to actually like book something within like a cup like a certain amount of time so in that regard yeah like to be on tv to be on film or even be on theater is kind of my indication of like how far I'm getting to my goals which is maybe not so healthy because there are so many factors that that indicate if you're going to get the job or not and it really has nothing to do I think it has something to do with how hard you work but it's definitely not the full picture so so are you in uh, SAG after and then you got the agent or, or are you still non-union or uh... um I had the chance to be tafted but I didn't absolutely need to be tafted my agent said to stay out of the out of the union as much as you can until you absolutely have to because once you're tafted it bars you from getting other jobs that are not union but still pay yeah that's what i heard of it then there's less work unless you like you really establish yourself before right. yeah. yeah and then there's yeah, a, then you end for up... a co-star yeah what, what were we gonna say about co-star uh... yeah if it was like for a co-star or something or something something to be on a show or something like that then yeah then you would have to get tafted yeah and, and, and i know it's like you, you end up spending a lot of money too like the, the sag dues and that was oh like my three, gosh three thousand yeah 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 but, that's but, what would i you, too so yeah but um so what, what would you say about like the process of like getting an agent did you like have to have like some roles under your belt first or did they just like did they just want to work with you like when do you think it's time for someone to get an agent when they're an actor? Oh my gosh, that is such a, I feel like a lot of people see you having an agent as some sort of confirmation that you're a real actor or you're actually serious about the business. Um, and getting an agent for me was like really hard because that's what I was so focused on. I wanted to get some sort of validation that I was get it that I was an actor that I was a working actor that I was serious about this so I was like I need an agent I need an agent and need an agent and I would call I would go on IMDb Pro and look up all these kind of co-star people on shows I could see myself in and I would collect just lists and lists and lists of agents and managers and I would cold email all of them and it was so fueled by this desperation to get represented and in New York City I think I got like one bite out of 500 and even then they were like no sorry and that was like the, the the only email I got but I went to LA and I think I must have cold emailed like 10 agents and two of them got back to me 
So I think it also depends on what market you are in. Um, but I got my agent who I'm not signed to were freelancing, which means I could freelance with other agents through a friend. And basically he recommended me. And I think that I've heard that's the best way to get an agent. Um, if someone else recommends you. Yeah. It's hard if like, you don't know someone who can connect you with an agent. Cause if you just like, if it's a, if it's an agent, you don't know, then it's harder to sign with them, I guess. So. Oh, correct. Like, cause they only have an email to know you as a person. And not even like you're not even supposed to send long emails. You're supposed to send like three lines and then a resume and the headshot. That's so easy to just delete, you know. Yeah. Um, and they're probably getting floods of them. Like every single actor is trying to get an agent, or under unrepresented actors trying to get an agent. So it's really easy to not look special in this sea of competition. Yeah, and there's also Actors Connection has like seminars. I don't know if you have you gone to anything in Actors Connection. They have where you can like meet agents or casting. Yeah, directors. yeah, you have to pay to basically per perform a monologue or something like that to a manager or an agent. And I probably did that. I did that seven different times, and they seemed to like it. And they did put a face. To, to who I was and my acting, but I never really signed with them or I never, they never offered to sign with me even after I followed up. So I think those kind of things you have to do very consistently. So like, have you gotten like roles, like auditions for like TV and stuff through your agent or like, or more independent film or what have you been auditioning for? Um, she gives me, so she's all across the board. She gives me commercials, theater and TV and film. Um, most of the stuff I think she gives me are commercials, which pay pretty much the most or um, seems to be more, there seems to be more opportunity for it, especially this time of year. I have gotten some TV commercials, I mean, uh, TV f shows for some are like short episode arcs and some are just co-stars. Those are the most nerve wracking for me. I think it's because I don't get a lot of them. And when I do, I really want to show this casting director who I am. And it seems to just have more stakes for me than like a Taco Bell commercial or something like that. For me, that doesn't really, although it pays pretty well, I don't really care as much if I book that or not. But if it's for a TV show, it's there's something about it that lights a fire under my ass. Um, so to answer your question, yes, occasionally I will get an audition for a TV show. So you want to be more, you care more about being part of projects that kind of excite you. like Very uh, much so. Yeah. More, more so than being a, even if it were like, a, I guess like an independent film or something along those lines. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, independent, independent to me is so vast. Like what does it mean to be an independent project? Because a lot of independent projects can be quite taxing to be a part of, especially if they're not funded or if they're thought, if, if, if it's made by people with the wrong reasons or if it's just made by people you don't collaborate well with. At some point, it doesn't make sense to do those kind of projects. Yeah, unless like you know the people and stuff like and what they're going for with their project and stuff. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. And do you find like backstage and actors access and sites where you submit where you don't necessarily like need an agent, you just like submit to the sites. Do you have you found those useful or not as much as like the agent finding rules? Ever, I will say ever since I've started getting auditions through my agent, I pretty much never go on backstage or actors access anymore. I think I should. But when I was on backstage and actors access, I really wasn't getting auditions and I think the reason is because it's so inexclusive they're getting swaths of submissions you know so the competition is a lot higher the pool is a lot bigger um versus there's a lot more underrepresented actors than represented actors is my sense so everyone and their mothers are auditioning or submitting for this one role so I think it's harder to get notice for that 
Um, so ever since then, I ever since I, I got an agent, I stopped going to backstage. Also, there aren't a lot of roles for me, I feel like, on backstage and actors access. Oh, like ones that fit like your type or ones that you think you'd be suited for? Yeah. Right. Because actors access is so inexclusive, the pool is going to be a lot bigger. And if I submit to something that says open ethnicity, female 20 to 30 years old, literally everyone's going to submit to that. So to me, it doesn't really seem per, like it doesn't seem worth it. Although there was a time where I was just kind of submitting like crazy and I, I really wasn't getting much re reply. So it just didn't seem like an efficient use of my time anymore. Yeah. And, and, and uh, so I guess it's like more for like when you're starting out actors connection and Oh yeah, I mean, thing, yeah. I'm, I'm part of a web series right now that has a pretty decent traction on YouTube and the whole, and it's getting into the direction of possibly being picked up by a streaming service. And um, I found them on backstage and the ad was looking for female actors who can do martial arts meets in Jersey. And so that was one of the first audition or submissions that I said to on backstage and it was just a group of dudes like regular dudes who were just putting together some YouTube videos it wasn't something big but out of that backstage submission I got to meet my main collabor collaborators today and be part of this project that grew because I started with them at such a humble beginning oh it's so a project done it's a project on YouTube or what Yes, it's called Power Rangers Unworthy. It's basically a Power Rangers fan series that is that takes the the franchise of Power Rangers and makes it PG-13 for the adults, adult fans of Power Rangers who might have loved it in the 90s or early 2000s. And there's a lot of dark themes. There's the violence kind of gets a bit more upped and more real and it's just for a more it's just for the same audience 10 years later, which I think is like a really cool concept. So you're, you're one of the Rangers or the. Yeah, I play Trini, the yellow Ranger. Um, it's pretty much an ensemble cast, depending on what the episode is about. Each episode kind of uh, centers around one of the Rangers, I feel like, but for the most part is an ensemble cast and it's really fight based. There's a lot of fight scenes and it's also story-based, which I really appreciate because I find a lot of action, especially independent action stuff, does not, does not seem to care about story. So, so it's, uh, so that's like your main thing you're doing now is that the Power Rangers, I'm worthy, right? The... I wouldn't say it's the main thing, but I would say it's the thing that has gotten me the most response and traction. Um, because it's so independently funded, a lot of it is funded by the creator of it. It's really, it really started on a shoestring budget and it's still on a shoestring budget, but it's, it's, um, it's definitely started to get it, get a lot of success, which um, I'm happy to write the coattails of, but it's definitely, we, so that is to say one episode takes about a year to do and there's a lot of prep involved. So um, we aren't, we aren't, or at least I am not working on it 24 seven. You know, I'm there when they're shooting or they need me. And then the rest of the year I'm going to class or going to the pit, doing my own thing. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it's hard to like write something. I think that's more of a challenge to write something that's like would require a lower budget than like a bigger idea. Yes. The idea the conception of the idea is always very exciting and simple. It's the execution that's always like, what? Like, even if you need a prop knife for one scene, it's like, no one has a prop knife. Okay, we have to go on Amazon, pay $17 for this prop knife, wait three days for it to come. And then when it comes and then it breaks and then like, and then what? So it's just like a small thing like that is like, well, what if you need, what if you have 17 costumes and people have to fight in them and the costumes break every single scene? Like, yeah. You know, it's it's frustrating and such a such a challenge, such a struggle that I'm so glad that I don't have to deal with right now. Yeah, I mean, I had some scripts where there were guns in the script too, and now I'm like kind of thinking, do I want to have the gun after the, the what happened with Alec Baldwin? Like, I don't know if I want to like do a script with a gun, but do you have to use like a re do they have to use like a real 
that's what I'm wondering is like, do they have to use like a real gun and script? Can they just do like a fake one and then put it in post or I don't know? Oh yeah. I mean, I, for me, I'm not, I'm not a weapon specialist off onset offset. Um, but yeah, to me, it, it seems pretty pointless to use a real gun with blanks. The, I read online though, the point of it is to make it look more real, but I don't know. It comes at such a high cost. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if you remember the movie The Crow with uh, Brandon Lee, Bruce Lee's son. Like he, he got killed in the it, same way. He got killed yeah. in the same way during the film, and they had to finish the film without him. And it was interesting because you watch his uh, interviews during that time. He's talking about like how life, like you never know, like when you're gonna die. You got to enjoy every sunset while you can. And he said that being interviewed for the movie where he got killed, so which was kind of weird. That is so, so twisted. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. But uh, I guess, I guess accidents, yeah, accidents happen on you get there's that's another thing you gotta take in mind is like crew safety and stuff like that if, when you're shooting a film. Yeah. yeah, I mean there was um a lot of stunt people. What was there was a woman, a stunt woman who lost her arm during one of the Marvel movies, stunt doubling. And then there was another woman who died doing a motorcycle stunt for another superhero film. So, you know, people losing lives on set doesn't seem to be a new concept, but I think because Alec Baldwin himself shot the gun, it seems to be like a huge thing now. And now we should do, now we should like change something about the industry. Meanwhile, yeah. Brandon Lee did die. Brandon Lee died yeah. a bunch of years ago, but we were, we're still using like real guns on set. So yeah, that, that happens a lot that there's like a big story that makes something that's always been going on like seem like, oh, this is the one incident where it happened. Right. But, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I was on uh, Gotham a while ago. Like, well, I'm in doing oh. background on Gotham. And uh, I remember there was the one scene where the guy gets set on fire and like he didn't have like the suit or anything. Now they just had this like gel he put on his head, the stunt guy. So like when he gets set on fire, like it, it's, it, it doesn't burn him. I, m- I remember I was like so anxious, like during that scene, like that he, like what, what would happen or something when they do that. But he ended up okay. But yeah, I just remembered that now. Yeah. I mean, fire stunts pay a lot from what I understand. Like, even if you like get your hand set on fire for two seconds and then you get doused by like 17 different fire extinguishers, that's a thousand dollars. So if you do a bigger stunt like that, like I can't, I wonder how much he got paid. Um, my friend is actually more in the stunt world than I am, and he has worked in fire burning sem- seminars with one of the fire coordinators in New York City. And safety is taken really, really seriously in the set, um, from what I understand. And the gel, the yeah, the gel is supposed to burn without burning your skin I, i'm speaking in such like elementary terms but um yeah that is uh i'm trying to say that they put safety in very very high regard in those kind of circles but then once you introduce someone like who's not a stunt person into the into the equation i feel like they actually are more oblivious than the people who work with us all the time yeah and that's i guess why you have to be careful doing that in like an indie project because oh yeah there aren't as experience with it oh my so. god and you don't have insurance probably and you know you have less regulations which yeah that sounds that sounds really scary yeah but have you thought about doing stunt like knowing martial arts and everything yourself or yeah i would totally do like fight stuff i would not do any motorcycle or car car driving fast and furious things <laughs> i wouldn't do high falls I wouldn't do burns because I, it takes, it's a lot of money to learn a burn. Um, But I would say my specialty, if I did have one, is fighting, fight choreography, which you can still do as an actor and not a stunt person. Yeah. So that's, oh yeah, you can, um, so that doesn't qualify as like a stunt. It does. It does. I guess like my main ambition in life is to be an actor and I'm using martial arts as a way to enhance 
um, putting myself as an actor forward rather than taking the root of putting myself as a stunt person. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So you'd rather be like the actor that sometimes do, does their own stunts. I guess. Yeah. Right. Right. So how did your interest in martial arts develop? Like how did, like in what kind of martial arts did you study? I think I started off well, I was I always really liked athletic activities. I liked sports as a child. So and I was obsessed with martial arts specifically for some reason. But growing up, um, my mother just didn't want me, I guess, like um, from some sexist ideology. She was like, girls don't fight. So she's like, you can't do martial arts. And I was like, fuck that. That kind of made me want to do martial arts even more. So I actually started off in Taekwondo which is a kicking martial arts, not a lot of punching from what, from what I did. And then from there, I would go on and off with Taekwondo and, you know, it's really easy once you start off in one martial art to branch out into other martial arts. Cause a lot of the basics are similar and the communities are so like overlapped with each other. So I started off with Taekwondo. Then I did this Chinese kickboxing called Sanda and I did some Kung Fu and Muay Thai and mixed it all together really until I met these stunt guys who taught me fight choreography, fight fighting, stunt fighting, my bad. And um, yeah, from there, I just trained with them. Stunt fighting is really just normal martial arts, just tweaked a little bit. So I I learned a lot of regular martial arts from them as well. Yeah, that's something I I do want to learn at some point, uh, I, I think jujitsu, from what I heard of it, mm. seems like the, I know there's a like difference between the different schools and martial arts, but uh, from what I heard about jujitsu, it sounds good. I know there's like a mindfulness too with martial arts too, so that's like the other thing is appealing. Like I want to eventually fit, like learn that and like fit that more in my life too. Like with the other, when I can find time to fit it with everything else I'm doing. But, yeah. yeah, I mean, I think. There's a reason why so many people stick to martial arts and once they stick to it, they kind of hold on to it. I think there's so much value there in mindfulness and discipline and health, not to mention, and community. A lot of martial arts places form a lot of community because you're really trying to achieve something together. Everyone should really try it, I think. And jujitsu, I actually don't really know grappling martial arts that well. I started jujitsu really recently. And um, I've noticed a lot of men really like jujitsu. And basically, if you've ever seen it, uh, seen like fights, they're, it, they're mostly on the ground. There's a lot of body contact because it's basically a type of wrestling. Um, but you have to sense where the other, what the other person is about to do. A lot of jujitsu sh- schools won't teach you how to strike which is what I'm more used to. I'm more used to striking based martial arts. Um, so yeah, jujitsu, I think there's a lot more con- like body contact with your opponent. My theory, it might be a hot take, but I find a lot of guys who have done, even done martial arts throughout their lives, really specifically like jujitsu. And whenever I ask them that, they, ne- they never can give me like a really straightforward answer. And my theory is that jujitsu is a way that men can express connection through touch without it being sexualized. In society, I feel like men can't touch other men without it being judged. So I think in jujitsu, classes of jujitsu, they can form that bond and that relationship through non-sexualized touch because it's it's fighting. Yeah, so it's like developing deeper male bonds in a way they wouldn't be able to. Yeah, more naturally yeah. otherwise. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but is there is there a school of like martial arts that appeals to you the most? Like the, you find the most. You mean like style? Yeah. I think it changes. Um, kicking has always been my bread and butter, so Taekwondo has always been something I felt most comfortable with, but. Something I'm more comfortable with doesn't necessarily mean it's my favorite. I do like jujitsu as well, but I I have a very basic knowledge of it. I think right now it might be just stunt fighting. I really like stunt fighting because yeah. there's a big collaborative dance quality to it. 
and also it's acting as well to some extent so i would yeah. say stunt fighting yeah that's interesting because because i i um i guess i always thought it was like you learn one school and then it's harder to learn and like people just learn one thing because then but you, you can kind of make you can kind of learn different styles and then kind of mix them together at times or yeah that- i mean sometimes it's like relearning things there's like a quote i think bruce lee said it if he didn't i sound like an idiot but you have to empty the cup you have to empty what you what you think you know in order to learn something new um and a lot of traditional martial artists who transition into stunt fighting have a lot of trouble because stunt fighting is to show the audience it's supposed to really tell the audience what your body is about to do versus real martial arts if you did that your opponent's going to see that a mile away and you're going to get hurt so the goals between the two are very different and sometimes people will find that transition really difficult um but i think once you get over that hump and it goes with any kind of intersectional um, martial arts things the base since the basics are very similar once you get over that initial hump of transitioning i feel like it's then easier to mix your knowledge and blend what you knew before yeah i guess it's kind of like learning from different acting schools and then kind of yes combining it yeah but i remember the blue the bruce lee quote i think you were talking about he was saying are you talking about the way he says be water be water um not quite but yes i think this 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 also applies here be water be adaptable be fluid you know you can't be too rigid on what you think you know because you're you're always learning new things yeah that's true yeah yeah, it's kind of it's kind of like the uh, well, I guess that's kind of like the the da- This is a little off topic, but like with, with like Taoism, kind of like the flowing. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I like a lot of the teachings of like Taoism and stuff. That's probably like more where my like spiritual beliefs, I guess, lean towards. Like, I've nice. Stuff, but yeah, yeah. But um, you, you said that uh, th- there was an interesting thing you said earlier. You said that um, like your parent, like with the martial arts, it was because like your mother said that. Um, like girls can't do fighting and stuff like that. W- was it at all like that with some of the other stuff you pursued, like in the arts and acting, or was was there other people who pursued the creative arts in your family? No, I'm. I mean, me and my siblings are pretty much the only ones who ever wanted to be an artist. And now my siblings are doing computer science, so um, you can argue that's art. But I mean, like they they never wanted to be actors. I think they really liked um, graphic design for a while, but as far as my whole family, I'm pretty much the only one who wants to be an actor or wants to have a life in the arts. You know, everyone else, a lot, a lot of my family is actually in computer science. Hmm. Did they want you to follow that path or like, and then you went another way or were they kind of more just, oh, you know, like whatever makes you happy kind of thing? My dad is very that. Um, He's like, whatever makes you happy, which is like very unusual, especially for Asian immigrant families. Um, It's not that they, uh, they want me to go into computer science, but they want me to make a stable amount of money to support myself, which is kind of, which kind of, kind of seems like a priority in a lot of Asian American cultures. So when they were like, how are you going to make money as, as an actor? Um, that's kind of their main, their problem with it, that acting doesn't make money. So um, that's their take on it. Hmm. And have you found like, it's hard to like work, like pursue it on top of doing like a, like a bread and like a full-time bread and butter job? Or yeah. do you think it's easier to make it like, just like your one focus? Well, everyone's, everyone's situation is different. If you have two parents already in the industry and they're pretty established you know you can basically just you know be in their stream and make it there um and also you know it depends on how much income your family's willing to support you with that's also a main factor you know are you living at home are you paying rent you know like how many how many privileges do you have in your life I think that's why you see so many people in acting school 
who tend to be pretty rich. I knew from an early point that I was never going to work in the food industry because it was never going to be worth it for me and to always just find other jobs. Um, my survival job is heading more towards fitness. So I teach a lot of kickboxing and that's kind of like my survival job right now. I used to dabble a lot with odd jobs like dog walking and front desk jobs, um, a lot of that kind of stuff. But now I find that once you focus in on more, something more specific, it's a lot easier to organize into your life. So kickboxing to me, although it's not acting, it has elements of acting into it because when you're teaching a class, you have to manage attention. You have to juggle different things happening at once. And you have to be, um, you have to be able to engage many people at once, which I find are, is very relevant to acting. So every single thing I do in my life, I try to kind of orient it towards acting in some way so I can justify it. You know, like I wouldn't be working, you know, packing boxes and Amazon, even if it paid like $20 an hour, $25 an hour, I wouldn't be able to justify it. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Cause, um, yeah. Cause I like, I have a, like a, a full-time day job now, but, uh, I'm trying to find something more like in my field, like on the product, like media, like, or maybe something more with like, kind of like using the skills I do with the podcast. Cause I want to be more in that realm all the time. But, um, yeah, I mean, for now it's good. as like a bread and butter kind of job, but, uh, yeah, I, I, I want to be more like everything I do, like in the road, that's easier to organize, like you said. So it's hard, you know, especially in New York, cause the, it's so hard to find anything that will pay that has anything to do with arts. If you're, if you're kind of new to it, or even if you've been in it for a while, it's, it's, it's hard. But uh, any, any final thoughts or anything you want to say, like before we wrap up or. Um, well, thank you, Sean, for letting me be on your podcast and ramble about some thoughts. Um, yeah, this was really nice. Yeah, I usually like... don't like talking about myself, but it felt pretty natural. So thank you. And um, yeah, hopefully someone will be entertained or get something out of this. Um, but yeah. Thank you for listening to BSing with Sean K. If you like this episode, be sure to subscribe on Spotify or iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. Give me a like on Facebook or a follow on Instagram, BSing with Sean K or S K N E E E S E one nine eight nine on uh, Instagram. And that's about it for this episode. I'll catch you on the next. BSing with BSing with what? BSing with Sean K. BSing with.